up there right away. You are.
your bodies rest secure. For God does not give us up to death, but shows us the path of life. Praise the Lord. And let us pray together. Holy God, creator of all that is and is to come, you made the world and we all do good. We thank you and we praise you for what you have done to have on your good creation. Yet you promised to make all things whole. Smiths. It's Pastor David and Lindsay Greenwald. 
Um, they, uh, they had just experienced a miscarriage. And, and, um, and uh, so uh, they asked that they be put on the list too. So uh, there are a few things that touch many of us more than that. So uh, please remember them. Is there anyone else that should be on the prayer list? Besides all of us tomorrow when we have pneumonia, <laughs> I'll add us next week. So. The world, the world needs to be prayed for. Let's get it all. Are you sneaking in? Oh, okay. I didn't see you. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Benevolent ruler of nations and protector of peoples, we come with thanksgiving for your mighty care. You do not draw apart from your people, but through Christ choose to dwell in our midst. We give thanks that he became the servant of humanity and stooped to the needs of the lowly and humble. In him, we have the assurance that you hear us when we pray, grieve with us when we are afflicted, mourn as we do the loss of loved ones, and care enough to judge and redeem us when we stray from your way. We pray for those who govern us in society. Give to them a sense of your compassion and care. Keep them from setting themselves apart from the needs of those whom they serve and endow them with patience and wisdom to work for the well-being of all. As we elect them to office, office lead us to entrust them with sufficient authority to perform their duties. Keep us from ignoring their judgments and help us to serve with them for the common good of all people. We pray for leaders of foreign lands whose align with us and those antagonistic toward us. Help us to work with our allies for common strength, shared benefits, and greater commitment to justice and peace. With those who are antagonistic, grant us understanding, compassion, and the humility to see their point of view. Keep us through Christ from rebuilding the walls of enmity and hostility he came to abolish. And may we through your spirit be granted significant wisdom and courage to work peaceably with all peoples. We yearn for the time when your vision is realized and the lion shall lie with the calf and war shall be no more. All this we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
real one? I'll just come here. Um, okay, our scripture lesson today is from the book of Mark 13, verses 1 through 8. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings? Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us. When will this be, and what will be the sign that all of these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place. But the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is the beginning of the birth pangs. Let us pray. Great and gracious Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Looking over the sermon this morning, I decided that I needed to add a whole part to it. And what a Sunday to think of that, right, when it's freezing in here. But I'll make it short, I hope. Um, beginning toward the end of the church year, which is what we're in, and of course next week we're going to kind of knock the, the place out because we're going to be Thanksgiving. But then we have uh, the first Sunday of Advent. So toward the end of the church year and the beginning of Advent, there are some very strange readings from Scripture. As a matter of fact, there are readings that some people would rather pastors didn't read or pastors decide they won't read because it just seems to muck things up. But you know me. There is a theme that comes through, both in this Sunday's reading from Mark, and it will come in the first Sunday of Advent with a reading from Luke. And it's not about uh, the baby Jesus or Mary or Joseph or shepherds or kings or pretty trees and ringing bells. As a matter of fact, the lessons are about the end of time. Uh, we learned that great word last week, eschatology, which is about uh, the end times, about the eschaton, when life uh, as we know it will end. And there's another word that goes with it that is often used with the eschaton, and that is the apocalypse or apocalyptic. Uh, that does not necessarily have to do with the end times. It's a very special kind of writing uh, where people are given information. Uh, when there is revealed, uh, usually to a, um, a prophet or someone named John in the book of Revelation, um, it is revealed to him what is going to happen, the book of Revelation. In chapter 13 of Mark, we have what is called the Little Apocalypse, because it's only one chapter. 
so it's little. But it has to do, and it uses apocalyptic language, which is language that is supposed to help us understand what's going to happen. And this language is specifically about when Jesus is coming again. Uh, for us, this isn't a big thing, probably. But for the early church, it was the only thing. The earliest Christians believed that Jesus had promised to return, and to return soon. So it is almost in scripture that we get the sense that five minutes after Jesus was resurrected, his followers wanted to know, okay, and what day are you coming back? It defined how they lived together as a community of faith. Following Jesus initially, still even, is not easy. These people gave up everything they knew. In many cases, they gave up entire families, work, their social position to follow Jesus. And so their lives were in chaos. And they were afraid. But they still wanted to follow Jesus. And the thing that kept them moving along was the belief that Jesus would return soon. All you need to do is write is read Paul's letters that were written 10 or 15 years after Jesus died and was resurrected. In Paul, especially in his early letters like Thessalonians, which we will read from during the Advent, Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. You need to stay faithful. You need to keep working. He will come. I always like to say Paul meant next Tuesday. Okay? That's how much, that's how great the anticipation was for Jesus' return. And if you have that kind of anticipation and it hasn't really been that long, well, maybe you can keep it up. Keep up the faithfulness. Keep up waiting. Except Jesus didn't come next Tuesday or Thursday or next month. By the time we get to the Gospels, Mark, for instance, it's been a while. As a matter of fact, it's been a good 40 or 50 years since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the people of his church find themselves still trying to remain faithful. They are trying to remain faithful in one of the most chaotic periods of history for the Jews. That was the Jewish Roman war. The Romans had gotten tired of the Jews acting up and acting stupid. So they decided that they were going to put an end to it. And they did. The Romans invaded Jerusalem, invaded Judah, I went out again, didn't I? And invaded and invaded Judah, and in the process, they even destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. This was 
Herod the Great's temple. It was the most magnificent temple of the three that had been built. And they destroyed it. And it would never be built again, rebuilt again. When they talk about going to the Holy Land and going to the Wailing Wall, that is the one wall, the part of the wall, that is left of the Temple of Jerusalem that was destroyed in the first century. This was the time that these early Christians lived in. And guess what? They thought, this has got to be it. Okay? Everything is being destroyed. Everything. Even the temple in Jerusalem has been destroyed. And they told themselves, this has to be it. Jesus has to be coming back now. Whoops. Oh, Lord, I lost her. <laughs> Somebody else can finish it, can you? And so, Mark is writing to these people, and he's thinking, holy cow, these people are going nuts. What am I going to do? And so he looks carefully into the traditions that have come down to him in that brief period of time. And yes, Jesus did talk about an end coming. But Jesus worried just like Mark worried and the other gospel writers would worry, is that people would lose their minds and go, there he is. There's Jesus. <gasps> That's the one we're supposed to follow. We're going to go over there and follow him. And they did. And Mark had to stop it. And so Mark worked with the beliefs that Jesus had about when he would come again. And the biggest lesson we get is this. When is not important. Mark was trying to pull these people back from the edge. Look, he says, yes, there will be rumors of war. Yes, there will be famines. Yes, awful things are going to happen. But that doesn't mean Jesus is coming now. That's not your concern. When isn't the concern? And as you read through this chapter of 13, chapter 13 in Mark, you discover what is important. What is important is keeping on with the ministry. All this other stuff happens. Oh, I almost said something bad. All this stuff happens, and it's going to keep happening. And when Jesus returns, Jesus will let us know. But until then, that is not your concern. Your concern is that God has won, Jesus Christ was resurrected, and now we get to live resurrection lives. Even if the rest of the world doesn't, or doesn't want to. We get to remain faithful. That's what the book of Revelation is about. I know my one little class is reading it. The point of Revelation is God wins. God wins. God won. And we can continue to live our lives of faithfulness. Now, I would like to tell you that 
at that point, after Mark wrote that wonder, wonderful apocalypse, that everything got settled. But it didn't. Because people will have never let the idea go that they can figure out when Jesus is coming again. We've all heard stories, seen the movie, or read the book. Remember the Left Behind books? I, I was out at Wadesville then, and I had two or three people in my church who were obsessed with these books, obsessed with them. So finally I read them. And um, see, Reverend Mary, this is what's happening. Look, this is what's happening. And I love these people dearly and never, you know, and want to say, but that's always here. But those things have always here. Always. There's never been a period in history when that stuff doesn't go on. Jesus is not here, and when he's here, we'll know it. The concern is not that stuff, but what we're going to do in the in-between time. It is really easy to get sucked in to the anticipation. <laughs> it's hard to get people to anticipate at all anymore, to be very honest when Jesus will come. But at least at the end of the church year, in the beginning of the new church year, there is an attempt to say that anticipation is good. We need to feel like Jesus could walk in that door any minute. That scared the poop out of this woman. Uh-huh. We need occasionally to feel that way, especially when we have let down and let go of our ministry. But again, it is not the be-all and the end-all. We are the people who are just supposed to work and do what we've been called to do. God's in charge of that part. And if we truly believe that God is in charge of that part, then what exactly would we think we'd have to do with it? I have no idea if that was my sermon or not. <laughs> if it wasn't, I'll use it again. Uh, but, and we will. Uh, the first Sunday of Advent, who, um, which lots of pastors, uh, well, I'll talk about that the first Sunday in Advent, but um, that's part of the deal. And when people start running around like chickens with their head cut off, and the sky is falling, the sky is, it isn't. God's holding it. All we got to worry about is what we got to worry about. Everything else is taken care of. Honest. God won. Even when it looks like it was lost. God won. Um. <clears throat> With glad and generous hearts, let us bring our offerings to God.
can we thank you, O oh God, for all that you have done? You give us life, you give us hope, you give us your very self. Take our offerings and our very selves, that your will may be done in our church, in our community, and throughout your wide and beautiful world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.